My message today is entitled, Don't Weed the Garden and Other Stories. It's the 24th message in our Red Letter series. It's based on Matthew 13, verses 24 to 52. Now, last week we looked at the parable of the sower. We looked at how and why Jesus started to teach in parables. Well, the rest of chapter 13 is filled with even more parables, and each of these parables has a very specific purpose. Jesus was using them all to explain what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is a term that Matthew uses quite a bit. The other gospel writers never use this phrase, kingdom of heaven. Instead, they use the kingdom of God. To be clear, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing. But remember, Matthew wrote to a predominantly Jewish audience. His purpose in writing his gospel was to show the Jewish people that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. The Jewish people regarded the name of God to be holy. They regarded it to be so holy that they avoided saying it. It was thought that it was too holy to be uttered by sinful human beings. The Hebrew name for God is Yahweh, for our God. But rather than uttering that name, they would call him Hashem, which means very simply, the name. As a matter of fact, to this day, many Messianic Jewish believers, those are Jewish people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, as well as Orthodox Jews, will usually write the name G-D, rather than even spelling out God. Because of this, Rather than offending the people that Matthew was trying to reach, he called God's kingdom the kingdom of heaven. Now, while I understand why Matthew used the term kingdom of heaven, it's important that you and I understand what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about the afterlife. He's not talking about this very real place called heaven. Oh, that may be part of it, but this is about a lot more than what happens after we die. The kingdom of heaven, at least as it relates to these parables, is all of those people who live as citizens of the heavenly kingdom here on earth. The kingdom of heaven is those who belong to Jesus in our world. The kingdom of heaven is the true church. We're supposed to be in this place, in our world, as ambassadors of Christ, and ambassadors of another kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. We live in this world, but we are not supposed to be of this world. Like we may be American citizens, and that is a great blessing, by the way, but we are first and foremost citizens of our Father's kingdom. And we represent him in our world. We live by his rules, and we honor him. We are the kingdom of heaven, we are the salt, we are the light. We are here to point the world to our true eternal home and to their eternal Savior. We are the kingdom of heaven. Understanding that will help you understand these parables. The first parable Jesus teaches in our passage today is often called the parable of the weeds. Here's how it goes. Matthew 13, 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. 25. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. Now, if you remember last week, when we looked at the parable of the sower, the seed represented the gospel. But just because the seed represents the gospel in one parable doesn't mean it will always represent the gospel, as we'll see in a few minutes. The owner's servants, verse 27 says, came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Remember, in our parable of the sower, the seed was the incorruptible gospel. There was nothing at all wrong with the seed, and there was not a problem with the sower. The problem was with the soil, which represented the heart of the person hearing the gospel. This time, there is a problem with the seeds, or at least some of the seeds. An enemy did this, he replied in verse 28. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? Okay, now let's just for a second pretend this is just a farming story. 
Think of it purely from a farming standpoint. Think about a real wheat field. The wheat already has heads on it when the weeds pop up. Can you imagine how much wheat would be destroyed if they went stomping through the field to try and pull out the weeds? It would wreak terrible destruction. And that's why in the story Jesus says, no, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The answer is to let the two grow together until the harvest. And then as you are harvesting the wheat, separate out the weeds to burn them. Now, I really want to start explaining this parable. But our Lord is going to do that in just a few verses. So keep the weeds in mind as we move on. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Verse 32, though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Remember when Jesus spoke about faith the size of a mustard seed moving mountains? Well, once again, Jesus is taking a little bit of a different view here. This time the seed is the kingdom of heaven. This time the seed, the mustard seed, is the true church. At that moment, that seed was very small and vastly outnumbered. The church was very small and vastly outnumbered. But Jesus was saying it would not be that way forever. That little seed called the church was going to grow. And it was going to fill the earth. That small group of disciples, and that largely meant the twelve, though Jesus had as many as 120 disciples at one point. These are people who would have been called his disciples anyway. Regardless, even 120 was a very small amount compared to the world population. But even though the church was as small as a mustard seed, one day it would be a power for good in our world including a large portion of the population. Then Jesus gave them another parable about the kingdom. It's not a big parable. It's a single verse. But the power in this statement cannot be denied. In verse 33, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now, for the record, I do not bake. But even I know what yeast does. You add a little yeast to the dough and the dough starts to rise. But did you ever wonder how? Well, it turns out that yeast is actually a living thing. Now, it's not an animal. It's not exactly a plant either. It's a single-celled fungus, kind of like a mushroom. It feeds on the sugars in the dough, and it expels carbon dioxide bubbles. Now, that's what causes the dough to rise. I'm really glad I looked this up, because I had heard in a science class a long time ago that yeast were animals. And so bread rises because millions of tiny animals were breaking wind into your bread. This is not the case. What Jesus is saying is that just like it only takes a small amount of yeast to infiltrate a big pile of dough, this is what his church is supposed to be like in our world. No, not breaking wind. But we're supposed to be out there helping the community to rise. The church being in the world and even in a community is supposed to change the world around them to the point where everything we touch grows and expands and starts to look like Jesus. We see this throughout the history of God's people. In the Old Testament, the people of God started with one man, Abraham. He and his wife had a son, who in turn had two sons. One of them, Jacob, through a very interesting series of events, ended up having 12 sons, including Joseph, who was sent off to Egypt being sold into slavery but ultimately fulfilling God's purpose of saving his family. By the time Joseph's 13 years of servitude and imprisonment passed, Jacob's family numbered 70 people. That's pretty substantial growth. 
but they were still a tiny group compared to the amount of Egyptians that were all around them. Of course, by the time the 400 years of silence between Genesis and Exodus passed, they were such a large group, well over a million strong, that the Egyptians feared them enough to put to the point where they enslaved the Jews and sentenced all their little boys to death. And still, the nation grew. In the New Testament, once again, it all starts off with one man, Jesus. Once again, he surrounds himself with 12 men, just like Jacob's family. Again, this is a, a barely a blip on the face of the Roman Empire, but God was at work. Where the Jewish people in the Old Testament grew largely by reproducing, the church grew by the power of the Holy Spirit. As the church was reaching out and people were getting saved, the church grew to about 120 during the three-year ministry of Jesus. And then just after he was resurrected and ascended, God added to their number 3,000 people in one day and added to their number daily those who were being saved. Jesus is saying the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of heaven, is in this world to influence it and reach it and change it and grow it. And while I'm on the subject, we are supposed to change the world. The world is not supposed to change us. Remember, we're the yeast in the dough. The dough will not rise without the yeast. The world will not rise without the gospel. And it is totally dependent on the church and our God to bring the gospel. We need to mix in and stand out if we want to see things change. But the church operating in the power of the Holy Spirit is the agent of change. Next, we have a passage that we used last week. Matthew 13, 34 and 35 says this. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what, the spoke, what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Again, the parables were illustrations to help open-hearted believers to understand. And they were a form of judgment on the hard-hearted people who refused to believe. They're simple stories that bring with them great spiritual truths to those who are open to the truth. Look at verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. So Jesus and the disciples are finally alone. It appears the disciples don't fully understand the parable. That doesn't mean that they're some of the hard-hearted people. And you can see that because even though they don't completely understand it, they're seeking truth. And Jesus was about to give it to them. And in the process, he also gave it to us. Verse 37, he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. Remember in the parable of the sower, the sower was anyone spreading the gospel. This time, the sower is the son of man. Jesus is the sower. The field is the world, the whole world. And the good seed are the people of God, the kingdom of heaven. This makes sense, right? Because the only way we can enter the kingdom of heaven, the only way we can become the people of God is through Jesus. And when we come to Jesus, he doesn't take us out of the world. He puts us into the world to do his business and spread his gospel. We are literally planted by God into his church to do his purposes in our world. This is our purpose. We are not in this church by accident. You aren't, I am not, nobody is. God drew us here to live out his purposes in this place. But then we get to the weeds. The rest of 38 says the weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Now, here's the thing. We don't know who are the weeds and who are the wheat. And it's not our job to pull them up before the harvest. All that would do is wreck the wheat. Folks, here's the thing. We don't know what God is doing in people's lives sometimes. Folks, there was a time where I was a big old nasty weed. But God was at work, and he made me wheat. God can do that. God can make wheat out of weeds. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of God. 
And we Christians have been entrusted with the gospel. Now there will come a time where time will run out. And there will be a harvest of souls. Some to eternal life, others to eternal fire. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age, verse 40 says. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out his kingdom Every weed out of his kingdom, excuse me, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now again, we don't know who's who. We have no way of knowing who's who. But then we're not the ones who have to decide. God already knows what people will do. God already knows what people will decide. It's up to us to prepare the way for the return of Christ. And we do that by spreading the gospel. God is still in the business of making wheat out of weeds. And so we must be faithful and point our world to Jesus. And the love of God, the love of Christ compels us because people perish without Jesus. And our Lord doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It's God who changes hearts. But we who love him must faithfully do his will, representing him and doing it well. To those who do, look what he says. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now we don't know who the weeds are, but we are here to bring as much wheat as possible into the barn. Then once again, Jesus adds a new parable. The parable of the treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven, verse 44 says, is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Verse 45 continues again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now these two are really one story told in two different ways. The point being very simply, being part of the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything else in the world. It's so valuable that if we truly understood its value, we would give everything this world has to offer up to have it. It's like the other week when we read about Paul saying, compared to knowing Jesus, everything else is garbage. Now, please don't hear me the wrong way when I say that. Loving your family and your children is, of course, not garbage. And there are many things that God has blessed us with that make life better, and we should be grateful for all of it. We just have to make sure that all of it occupies the right place in our lives. Yes, loving your family and your children and all the people God has given us to love is of great value. But it is Jesus that makes that relationship last forever. Without Jesus, all those relationships will end and they will not end well. So while our love for others is important, our love for Jesus is of even more importance. And to have Jesus in your life is worth any sacrifice. Finally, Jesus gives us the parable of the net. Verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into blazing fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is just the parable of the weeds told in a different way. Some of Jesus' followers were farmers, some were fishermen. And so Jesus told the parable in a way that the fishermen could relate to. Now one of the things Jesus was showing them and us in this parable, I, I think is that it's not just for people who are outside the religious community. The weeds and the bad fish were not just those that his people would have called heathens, right? Some of the most respected religious people in their society would have counted 
as part of that bad fish weed group. Jesus was showing them and us that some people, some of the people who are the religious leaders are the people who will be thrown away. Notice that. Not thrown back, they're thrown away. They acted all high and mighty and religious, but their hearts were far from God. Think about many of the Pharisees. These guys were really committed to following the law and following the scriptures. Yet the Messiah, the one foretold through their scriptures, stood right before them, fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, doing miracle after miracle after miracle. And they not only rejected him, but they plotted against him to put him to death. And they stirred up the crowd against their savior. In the process, these people who would have called themselves servants of the Lord were actively working against the Lord. Most of the people would have thought they were good fish, but the only thing they had in common with fish was the stink. We have to be careful with this as well. And I know I'm a little bit of a broken record on this, but work with me. You have to check the teaching of anyone, including me, against the word of God. Look, I will never knowingly lead you astray, but I could make a mistake. And if you think I do, I want to know about it. And I pray that my heart would never be too hard to receive gentle correction. Right at the end of the passage, Jesus gives us a short explanation. He short of, sort of switches metaphors, if you will. The fish are people, and God's angels will be the sorting fishermen. And no matter how respectable their facade may look, the bad fish and the weeds wind up in the same place. Friends, we need to make sure that we are in the kingdom of heaven. Not just today, I mean not just at death, but today. And the way that, to that kingdom, and the only way, is through Jesus. We enter the kingdom through him alone, and without him, we are outside the kingdom forever. So the question for you today is, are you in the kingdom? Have you come into the kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ? Because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you're not sure, ask Jesus. Are you following him? Now, no one does that perfectly. But are you sorry when you fail? Does the Spirit convict you? Because the Spirit comes with the kingdom. He empowers the kingdom. And you receive him when you enter the kingdom through Jesus. If you're not sure about that, contact me. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Today. Come into the kingdom of heaven. Today. Jesus finishes his teaching with these words. Have you understood these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. The disciples have seen what Jesus meant and they understood. And that's a very good thing because these men would be instrumental in spreading the kingdom of God throughout our world. In fact, we are in the kingdom today, at least in part, because they understood. Do you understand? If not, again, please contact me. In verse 52, he said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Do you see what that means? Jesus desired for the teachers of the law, the very people who were opposing him, to come to him and be saved. Because they already knew what we call the Old Testament. And they uh, would understand how Jesus fulfilled all that God said about him from the beginning of time. They will see what Jesus would do and know how God foretold it. And they will be able to teach the people and lead them into all truth. In saying this, Jesus is hoping that even his harshest opponents will turn to him and be saved. Remember, it's his will that none should perish, but all would come to repentance. And friends, we saw that happen through a Pharisee named Paul. Think of all that Paul did in starting the church and spreading the gospel. One of Jesus' harshest opponents became one of his most ardent followers, 
Paul was a weed at one point, a big old nasty weed, opposing the church, having believers arrested and put to death. Paul was a bad fish, but in the hands of the master, he was transformed. And he was used to do tremendous good in our world. God delights in doing that very thing. So don't go about pulling the weeds. God's got angels for that. And don't start separating the good fish from the bad. He has angels for that too. You be a faithful citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Point people to Jesus and be prepared to be amazed. God is still in the business of making bad fish good and turning weeds into wheat. Jesus and the salvation he brings is of greater value than anything this world has to offer. So please, please, please hold on to him. Praise him and be faithful. Amen. <laughs>